Okay. Uh, probably speaking to the choir to a certain extent, uh, but my background, I'm a, a paramedic respiratory therapist for about 40 years. I retired from St. Petersburg Fire and Rescue after 30 years, retired as a captain back then, been with Mercury about 10 years. But uh, talking today about uh, why are you going to go to a smaller uh, BBM? Uh, I'm assuming everybody in the room is, is comfortable, familiar with a, a back valve mask, you know, manual ventilator, CPR bag, whatever term that you want to use. I've lectured on this topic at multiple conferences, even as far away as, as Hong Kong and, and Australia. Uh, and while doing the pre preparing for those lectures, I've also written some papers on it. I did some research on CPR bags and their sizes and why are they designed the way they are and why are certain accessories needing to be added to, to ventilation. Uh, when I looked at the current bag that everybody, not everybody, because people are switching over, it's a average size bag and that's what this is. This is the average adult bag. It's about a 1500 uh, cc bag. Uh, I tried to figure out where did the size come from? Why, why is it 1,500 cc's? I even looked at the um, the paperwork that was uh, submitted for the original Ambu bag back in about 1956, 1957. Uh, and even in their patent paperwork, there was nothing that identifies the size of the bag. So, so why is it that big? went far back as World War II when they used to use a bellows instead of a bag. And the bellows was roughly about a 1500 cc bellows, but they didn't explain why. Um, I went back and looked at my original respiratory therapy textbook. I still have it uh, from the late seventies. And when you would put a person on a, a ventilator, mechanical ventilation, you would calculate the tidal volume by using uh, between 10 and 12 mLs or cc's per kilogram. Now, most of us, when we do our math and stuff from drug calculations, we love uh, using 100 kilograms, make the math easier. So if, if that was the case, 10 to 12, uh, 100 kilograms, you don't get the bag totally flat, then it kind of made sense to have a 1500 cc bag. Well, let's move forward now to 2021. What's the standard now for setting up tidal volume for uh, ventilation? You may have heard of lung protective ventilation, pretty common in the respiratory field. The standard now is five to seven. Now this is not Mercury Medical, this is not Quad Med, this is not Steve LaCroix saying, this is what American Heart Association standards are saying. This is the European, Australian standards, uh, American College of Emergency Physician standards, are all saying five seven, but we're still using this size bag. And one of the articles that I was writing, I, I basically described that bag as an antique. We're using an antique because the standard medically has changed, but we continue to use it. In fact, I went to when they were still, uh, people still going to them instead of virtually, you know, uh, EMS World and EMS today. Now, EMS World coming up is going to be live so far. I was able to go to those shows and work in their uh, teaching area. And I chose to go over manual ventilation, which seems kind of simple. Uh, but I brought a, what they call a Michigan test lung. A Michigan test lung is what's used to measure volume very accurately. They use it for testing anesthesia machines and, and that type of thing. And I hooked up a computer to it with software and I wanted to see how well people ventilated because this machine will give you the rate, obviously it'll give you the volume, uh, it'll give you pressures and things like that. And I had about 400 people over two conferences come by and using the large bag, the standard bag, have them ventilate with their best technique. And there was everything from students to veteran medics to instructors. Um, I even did this at a respiratory conference. And about 95% of the people didn't ventilate properly. I mean, it was it was obvious. Volumes were high, rates were, were, were poor, uh, pressures were, were a problem. So I had to 
The second part of the uh, of the assessment, after them doing it with a large bag, I had them do it with a bag that looks like this. Now you can see there's there's a significant difference in the size. This is a 1500 cc bag. This is a thousand. And immediately they did exactly. I told them use the same technique that you use with a larger bag, but just do it with a smaller bag. And I would say almost pretty close to 90% of those that didn't do well did fine. The title volume was fine. It, w it was was it was in line with the standard. Now, now today they don't always use weight to create the standard. The, the 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 way now is based on height and male versus female. There's actually a math equation that you can do, but typically what we look for, as you know, is going to be chest rise. You know, so that chest starts to rise, you need to stop squeezing. So we really want to be using a a smaller bag. In my mind, we call this a, a Herit Mercury, we call it a small adult, but if you look at the standard, this should be an adult bag. And that's just our name for it. If you look at different manufacturers, they may call it a child bag, they may call it a pediatric bag. The key thing is what's the volume of the bag? This is a thousand cc's, but that is if you filled it up with water. We never get all of the air totally out, uh, it's got a functional volume of about 750 cc's, which is well in line uh, with the standard for almost everybody. But I had somebody uh, threw this out. I, it was kind of a silly question that I wanted to share. Somebody said, well, what if the patient weighs 650 pounds? We have to realize that if you go from 150 to 650, your lungs didn't get any bigger. They don't. What does change is the amount of pressure that it takes to move that mass. So it's gonna be a pressure difference, not a volume difference, okay? So, so I talked about why the volume meets the standard. But what we don't talk about sometimes is, we all know, and you've probably heard in school and you've heard it through other training, about barotrauma, injury caused by the pressure, but a lot of people don't mention the trauma to somebody's lungs that's caused by the overstretch, what they call volume trauma. So, so now we got two issues. We got barotrauma from an increase in pressure that would be created by too much volume. And then we've got overstretch causing damage to the tissue, another significant problem. You know, so the other thing is, and you, you can find the paper online, it's called the EPIC study, E-P-I-C. A Dr. Dan Spate was the lead investigator on that. I, I in fact, know Dr. Spate. Uh, and I read his research paper, and then I sent him a question because it talks about traumatic brain injury. And one of the issues that makes traumatic brain injury worse, there was, they call them the four H's. I'm not going to get into the four H's, but one of them is hyperventilation. And it's not just the rate it's the volume. So now we are causing issues with our brain injury patients by overventilating. And sometimes it's the technology that we're using that's trapping us into potentially causing more harm. You know, so you can look up that study. We also know that when we overventilate with pressures and volumes, you, you know this, it, you can drop somebody's blood pressure not really a good idea in a lot of the patients that you're gonna be ventilating. And then if you take these patients and you overventilate them and they're not, they don't have an advanced airway in, they're not intubated or they don't have a superglottic airway in, is that extra air goes into their stomach. Now, what happens when air goes into a patient's stomach? It's generally gonna come back the other way and it's gonna bring friends with it and the patient's got a better chance of aspirating. So if you look at it, we're using, we're causing injury from pressure, bare from injury from volume. We're dropping blood pressures. We're increasing chance of vomiting and aspiration. Which one of those four things are you comfortable with with your patient? Be willing to bet none of them. So it's a combination here. So the technology have changed. I, I taught at uh, St. Petersburg College in the permit program for about 35 years. And one thing that I learned over that time is that most everything that we learn at some point is either going to be challenged or found to be wrong. At one time, I would have said, you know, this is the bag to use, flatten it out, get as much volume as can. And then we realize 
that was harmful. We know now that that's harmful and, and, and shouldn't be done. So the advantage of this smaller bag that you're, you're going to, this is the one here, you notice it's got a lot of extra stuff on it that you may not have on your current bag. And a lot of it goes to protective ventilation. So I talked about the volume, so the smaller bag, smaller bag make makes sense. And again, uh, that's the standard. You can look it up, you can go to the uh, American Heart website and look at the volumes. that's what they're going to tell you. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice on here, it's kind of stacked on top. This is a peak valve, PEEP, -E positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, recently, I was working in a cadaver lab with uh, at a physician's conference, and they actually had a BLS station that they had to go through. The cadaver was missing the chest plate, so you could see the lung movement. And the doctor that was teaching that section, showing physicians, yes, showing the physicians how to use a manual ventilator, uh, and the value of using a peep valve on what it does to the lung. And it was so obvious when you look at the, when you can see the lungs, that the, when you put a peep valve on, the patient can only exhale so far. You're leaving some of the residual air, what they call the functional residual capacity, that's where gas exchange takes place. If you don't have a little bit of a peep in there, every time the patient exhales, they're gonna totally collapse, interfering with gas exchange, and then you have to pop those back open every time you bag the patient or they take a breath in. That's a problem. The peep valve also recruits, you have a lot more alveoli in your lungs than you use. I wanna recruit those. So if I can recruit those by using a peep valve, more the better. Now this doctor, and I'm just quoting him, he said, if you're not using a peep valve on a CPR bag, he said, you're just flat out doing it wrong. You know, now that's a pretty bold statement, but that's what he's saying. And I think there's some value to that. Everybody in the room, you have a little bit of peep that you create little bit of intrinsic physiologic peep that you have that you bypass in your patients when you intubate them. So it's actually creating some problems with ventilation and gas exchange when we don't have a little bit of peep in the system. So a peep valve, this one will come out of the bag in the screw where there's no peep at all. In most places, and I'm not trying to, to dictate protocol, most places will start out on about five or peep just to maintain the air, uh, the the gas exchange and to recruit some of the alveoli that may be collapsed. Okay, so you can see where adding some of these accessories, th to me, they're, they really shouldn't be optional. They, these are things that, geez, the physiology is telling me I, I should be doing this. I should be doing smaller volume and I should have a peep valve. Now we've added some things on, on this particular bag that you don't off, always see. It's becoming more common. Some states even require it. You'll see on the screen that this one has a pressure manometer so that you can actually know the pressure that you're, you're using. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, higher pressures, I talked about the barotrauma already, can interfere with certain types of airways if you get the pressure too high. I don't know if you carry uh, a laryngeal mask airway. Uh, I don't know if you're aware though that if you are, that higher pressures can cause the supraglottic airway to lose its seal and affect ventilation. So I really want to know where the pressures are that I'm doing this. Uh, if you're ventilating infants and small children, really should be kind of mandatory to do that. Um, I can't imagine putting somebody on positive pressure ventilation uh, whether it's on a ventilator, a manual ventilator, or whatever device that you're using, CPAP, BiPAP, whatever, that I'm not measuring this. So I, I think it's important that we do, that we actually measure pressures we're using. Another thing that was added in here is, as you can see on the screen, there's a little red tab here. If I pull that little red tab, you should be able to see a, a red flashing light. Now that flashing light is, is basically a reminder to squeeze the bag. Uh, a lot of times we turn the ventilations over maybe to a lesser trained person, and this helps them to when to squeeze the bag, and it's gonna flash every six seconds, which gives you that rate of 10. 
Now that only comes into play if the patient's got an advanced airway in, which could be a supraglottic, could be a king tube, could be a, an tracheal tube, whatever you're using. If they have an advanced airway in, then we know it's asynchronous to the compressions if you are working a, a cardiac arrest, uh, but it helps you with that. So we're trying to deal with volume, pressure, rate, and then adding a P-valve. You'll also notice one of the differences, this bag has a pressure pop-off. In this adult bag, you don't see a pressure pop-off valve, but you do on here. And the reason for that is that this bag could be used for children. Now, I would not take it down to an infant, personally. Um, it'll ventilate them, but if you're not trained to use a uh, self-inflating bag, which is what this is, of this size on a neonate, it's a pretty risky business. Um, you won't see this type of bag used in a NICU or labor and delivery, at least they shouldn't be. You're going to hear other devices like hyperinflation bags and TP resuscitators and stuff. So, um, but this would be, could take the place of a child and an adult bag. I'm not sure how you're doing it. That's really up to you folks or how you plan on um, using the product. Uh, the other thing is this obviously would have oxygen going to it. It's got a reservoir. Now it's, it's kind of obvious on the bigger bag, but what I wanted to show you in case somebody gets concerned, I'm putting the reservoir on here. I want you to watch how slow it is to recoil. And people, I, I've actually had people from other countries contact me and say, oh, the bag's too slow to recoil, too slow to recoil. So I have them send me a video. Well, it's a flat bag. You've got no air going to it. There's no gas flow going into the bag. So I'm pulling a vacuum through this little hole or a flat bag. If you decide you want to ventilate somebody with just room air, it's always best to pull the reservoir off and you can see it inflates quite readily with no problem. And the reason I mentioned that, there, there is going to be uh, a time, in fact, I'm lecturing at the EMS, Texas EMS conference coming up in November uh, on oxygen percentages during ventilation uh, and why we need to have other options. So you are seeing people starting to ventilate with room air or some combination of that. So. Uh, but I just didn't want people to look at the bag and squeeze it and think, boy, that's really taking uh, way too much time. Because if it's not cardiac arrest, you're obviously going to be ventilating, in most cases, faster than 10 a minute. So um, that's pretty much everything uh, as far as the physiology of why going to a smaller bag, where the standard comes from. You're more than welcome to look it up and why this configuration has the accessories that it does. So I know it's pretty tough because we can't communicate very well here, but you can throw up a question if you want. I'm gonna clear my screen a little bit here. Your department also knows how to get a hold of me. Your chief has my uh, email address if you have a question um, or uh, any comments that you would like to share, I'd be more than happy to respond. Okay, uh, something popped up, but I didn't get up quick enough to see it. If you could repeat what that was. NeoT, that is correct. Um, I'm glad y'all know about that. NeoT is actually a, you know, a TP's resuscitator. Uh, there are 